he is going to talk about period index questions on functions. So, thank you, Nagaraj, and uh, thanks for this invitation to get, give the the joint talk between CMI and Institute of Mathematical Sciences. I'm very happy to be back here to talk to all of you. <laughs> okay, so um, the. I can't I I can't hang it around probably. Seem to be having to hold this all the time. <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> uh, most of my talk concerns the Brower group of a field, F is a field. This denotes the Brower group of the field. This is a group given a field, this is a group invariant associated th to the field. And um, in fact, uh, uh, it was introduced by Brouwer, of course, he's named after him. He introduced this to study uh, the structure of uh, division algebra, finite dimensional division algebras over a field. That was his idea in introducing this field, this group. However, it, um, it has become a very important object of study, both from the viewpoint of uh, algebraic geometry as well as number theory. See, for instance, uh, you might have come across uh, like uh, or uh, for function fields or algebraically closed fields, the question, rationality questions and so on are tested by the Brouwer group, certain invariants associated with the Brouwer group. Also from number theory, once again, uh, Brouwer group has been extensively studied in the context of number fields, uh, in the just over number fields or global fields. And subsequently, there are also uh, like uh, this kind of Hasse principle for existence of rational points on varieties over a number field. That is, if you are given a variety over a number field, you want to test whether it has a rational point. You will test whether it has a rational point locally over all completions. Then you want to recover back the uh, fact that it has a rational point. It is not true in general. There are several obstructions. And one of the obstructions is in terms of the Brouwer group. Okay. In many sense of the term, uh, uh, both from arithmetic and geometry, this is quite a useful object which mm, comes into the picture. So today, I mean, I will just start with uh, what the Brouwer group is, just to remind you. So, so as I said, it, it is built out of finite dimensional central division algebras over F. So more generally, let me take A is a central simple algebra. Sorry, yeah? You also mentioned that you are giving a sequence talk. OK, I will uh, I'll give a follow-up talk at uh, CMI on Monday at 3.30, OK, a follow-up of this talk. Central simple algebra or F. And uh, this is simply by Wedderburn's theorem. This is isomorphic to a matrix algebra or a division algebra which is uniquely determined by A. So DA is a finite dimensional central division algebra over F. Okay, so you introduce the uh, equivalence among central simple algebras. This is called the Brouwer equivalence. Two central simple algebras are equivalent if and only if they differ up to a matrix factor. That is, MR of A is isomorphic to MS of B for some integers R and S. And you see, because every algebra uniquely determines up to a matrix factor, a division algebra, this is the same as the division algebra associated to A is isomorphic to the division algebra associated to B. So basically, uh, a Brouwer equivalence class determines a unique division algebra over the field F, which is finite dimensional central over F. And then, uh, so you take Brouwer equivalence classes, equivalence classes of central simple I just, just use this up abbreviation, central simple algebras over F. Um, and then you have the operation of tensor product. So tensor product of two central simple algebra is again a central simple algebra. The whole point of introducing this central simple algebra is because if you take two central division algebras and you take the tensor product, you could get matrix factors. So you can ignore the matrix factors and stick to division algebras. So this is simply the Brouwer group of F. So every element in the Brouwer group is represented by 
a finite dimensional division algebra over f. Of course, the trivial class is the class of just m r of f. This matrix algebra over f is the trivial class here. Okay, so given uh, a Brewer class alpha, given uh, given a class of a central simple algebra in the Brewer group of f, call this alpha. There are two numerical invariants you can associate it to this Brewer class. One is just the index of alpha, which only depends on the Brewer class. You just take the division algebra. You know that this division algebra, when you go up to the algebraic closure, it becomes just a matrix algebra. So its dimension is always a square, and and you take the square root of the dimension of this algebra over f. So this is the index of alpha. This is one uh, integer associated to alpha, and the period of alpha. Sometimes we always also call it the exponent of the algebra. It is simply the order of a, order of alpha, in the Brouwer group of f. Okay. So given a Brouwer class, you have two new integer invariants associated to the class, and it is classical that uh, the prime factors associated to the uh, prime factors occurring in the factorization of index alpha or the exponent alpha, they are all the same. So, in particular, you have that a period of uh, index of A divides, you know that period divides index and index divides the period of uh, index alpha divides period alpha to the power some power which depends on alpha, okay, because they have the same prime factors you can choose a power such that one divides the other. Okay. The interesting questions are of the following kind that for interesting classes of fields, okay, which I will mention what they are. Can you uniformly bound this uh, index in terms of the period in terms of this power? Is there a uniform bound for this power is some kind of natural question which comes up. So, let us look at the standard classical setting. So, if you just take, a, so f, f is a number field. Then the you have the sequence coming from the class field theory for the Brouwer group of F. It sits inside the direct sum of the Brouwer group of the completions of F at all places of given the number field, you have the, the set of places of the number field either corresponding to the discrete valuations or it could be the real place or the complex place, and you have these completions. And so you take the completions. So, you take a class, look at it as a tensoring with F v, you get a Brouwer class over F v. So, this map when it runs over, it is glance into the direct sum first of all and it is injective and also the local fields Brouwer group of F v, they are all extremely well understood in terms of local class field theory. If F v is the field of complex numbers, this is 0 because there are no finite dimensional division algebra over, a, over, a, over complex numbers. If it is the field of real numbers, it is a z mod 2 which is generated by the Hamilton quaternion algebra. And if it is a periodic field, so the local class field theory uh, gives a canonical identification of the Brouwer group of F v with q mod z. See there is a very natural map coming from the class field theory from uh, is making Brouwer F v identified with q mod z and you take the sum map. So, this is an exact sequence. If you use this and think a little bit, you will, it will follow that index z equal to period for number fields. So, for every central division algebra or a number field, as every central, um, every element, every class in the Brouwer group index is the same as the exponent, they coincide. In particular, if you take any element in the two torsion of the Brouwer group of a number field, it is in fact represented by a quaternion algebra. Quaternion algebra by definition is a dimension 4 and therefore index 2 algebra over the base okay this is the content, this is the classical situation okay so you pass from the number field to for instance function field in one variable or a number field you take q or q root minus 1 and they adjoin one variable and you may ask whether there are bounds like this when you pass from the number field to function field in one variable so, it is an extremely open question whether there are such bonds. Okay. In fact, I will explain more in more detail in my next talk the, the kind of uh, uh, difficulties you come across 
when you look at a number field and go to function fields. Okay? One does not know whether such bounds exist. However, if uh, instead of a number field, you take a slightly simpler object. Okay. So, what are the kind of general questions? Questions. Okay. So, are there bounds? Uh, bounds uh, for uh, uh, index uh, dividing exponent power this is the this is bound for the power which we are looking for are there bounds for fields f of the following kind okay what are the interesting fields uh, index dividing exponent and period i sometimes mix up period is in sometimes a classical setting and Brouwer group people call it exponent also. Okay. So, when I say bounds, it is bound for this question mark I have above. So, what are the kinds of interesting fields? You can look at f is finitely generated field. As a field, it is finitely generated means over the prime field. It could be a finitely generated over a number field or it is finitely generated over a finite field. So, this is one class or if you are a geometer, you may be interested in finitely generated over C or algebraically closed fields. This is another interesting question. Or if you are more interested in arithmetic, you may ask when f is a finitely generated field or a periodic field. Okay, these are the kind of fields where one could ask similar questions. Here I want to point out that there is some something common between finitely generated fields or which are positive characteristic. That is finitely generated over a, a finite field. Okay, this is one class which is no positive characteristic and uh, and this and also here finitely generated over complex numbers. These classes of fields have something in common namely they have some C n property. Okay. So, if you have a homogeneous, homogeneous form of certain degree in certain number of variables with number of variables just large enough with respect to the degree then they automatically represent 0 non trivial. These are the so called C n property and in fact, it was an open question whether there are such bonds for C i fields. Okay. But it is quite recent that there is a theorem by a young Israeli mathematician Mark III. So, quite recent I do not think we can even find a preprint on the archive. He proves in fact, there are such bonds for finite uh, either uh, all C i fields in general. Of course, the bounds are exponentially large. However, there are bounds in this case when in these cases, but uh, what is what are the cases which are open if you take finitely generated over number fields that is completely open and over periodic fields ok it is open in general for finitely generated fields, but I am going to discuss some results which can be proved when you restrict yourself to function field in one variable over a periodic field that is what I want to discuss today in the talk some progress in this direction. Okay. I mean, please let me know if you do not follow some notation or something. Yeah. So, Max is only about C n fields? Uh, C n fields, yeah, exactly. In fact, it was a very big question. One did not even know there were bounds in this. Absolutely beautiful, extremely simple, and beautiful algebra. It is a really impressive result. Yeah. Okay. So, let me just come to function fields of periodic curves. Uh, the bounds are the in some sense within quotes, but they are all exponential. Even for C2 fields, Artin's question is index is equal to exponent. It does not reach that. Okay, so. okay, so now, so let me state some things which are known in the case of function fields of uh, curves or periodic numbers. So, for this let me just uh, let me just give some names for certain integers, so that I do not have to repeat. So, let me call it a so Brouwer p dimension of a field f is bounded by n if for every uh, central simple al every alpha in the Brouwer group of f alpha is p primary um, period or index whatever it is p primary we have uh, Okay, it is better to say 
hereditarily for every all for every finite extension L of f and for every alpha in the Brouwer group of L. You want to put it hereditarily for finite extensions also. So, every alpha in the Brouwer group of L which is p primary index, we have that index of alpha divides p root alpha to the power n. Okay? If there is such a bound hereditarily for all finite extensions of f, you call that bound as the Brouwer p dimension of f and the Brouwer dimension of f is simply the maximum for all p maximum over all p of the Brouwer p dimension of f. Okay. So, we are looking we are looking for bounds for the Brouwer dimension or Brouwer p dimension as it is. So, the, this is okay. we can restate all the these questions in terms of the Brouwer dimension. Okay. So, let us uh, just now look at suppose uh, k is a periodic field. and um, x uh, uh, f is function field in one variable that is function field of a curve or or k field of a curve or k and suppose l is a uh, so the very first kind of bounding of Brouwer dimension results came from saltman so the Finite extension of QP, exactly periodic fields. You have analogs and positive characters, local fields also. I'm just sticking to periodic fields. As I said, the questions are uh, simpler if you take positive characteristic. Okay, so so periodic field means a finite extension of of QP. Okay, the, this is the very first kind of. Uh, Seminal result in some sense. Um, this was proved in Tata Institute. I keep saying whenever I lecture on this talk, this was proved by him when he was visiting Tata Institute and it was published in the Journal of the Ramanujan Math Society. So, uh, the theorem is that in this situation, if L is not equal to P, F is up, then Brouwer L dimension of F is 2. That is, if you take uh, the L primary algebra, the index divides period squared for every uh, every algebra of uh, L primary index and for every L different from P. In other words, you can conclude that every alpha in the Brouwer group as long as the period does not divide P does not divide the period, the index divides period squared. Okay? So, in fact, uh, applying this for P equal to 2, the very first results concerning the so called U invariant which I will again explain in my next talk more in more detail, U invariant means whether sufficiently large dimensional quadratic forms represent 0 non trivially. These are the kind of questions. The very first such results were obtained using Saltman's theorem for p equal to the prime 2. Okay. But then you have this constraint that it is a non dialectic periodic field. Okay. This, is the, this is the very first bound. And in fact, uh, more recently, there are some, uh, some, some more general setting in which similar results of, uh, I mean, slightly extended results are proved and there is a whole technology due to Harbetter Hartman crashing in terms of patching this is analogous to Arkin's theorem that's in in the art Arkin's conjecture uh, um, for c2 fields right yeah. yeah this is similar the whole point is that these do not have ci property okay this is a parallel kind of a, they don't have the ci property it's not c3 that is why I said if you take positive characters to local field, they become C3 and everything is uh, sort of you can, can be absorbed in the CI list, you know. But these are not CI fields, so it is some kind of a parallel direction, okay. Right. So, but then of course, the L equal to P is not covered in this case and, and it was open for a, until very recently is Brouwer P dimension for the bad characteristic. Is, is finite even. One did not even know that this was bounded not to talk of being equal to 2 or something. If this is the same as Brouwer dimension because all the others are bounded. If you have a bound for this, you have a bound for the Brouwer dimension. So, this is, so let me state uh, the result of Arbeta Hartman. This is a very, very useful patching technique. 
which works whenever you have a complete discrete valued field and then you have function field in one variable or a complete discrete valued field, then you have a whole lot of patching techniques which yield lots of results concerning either quadratic forms or Brouwer groups or principal homogeneous spaces and uh, connected linear algebraic groups. This is a general theory. Let me just state uh, what it is, uh, what you get in this, that, uh, what the theorem gives. So, so let k be a complete discrete valued field. discrete evaluated field with residue field kappa okay so and f is a function field in one variable field in one variable over k this is the same situation as qpt Okay, so you want to ask whether the Brouwer dimension here is bounded. So suppose characteristic of kappa is not equal to L. So you uh, you avoid the the prime involving the characteristic. And further, I mean, if you want, even if you take a discrete valued field and a residue field, you need some bounds on the Brouwer dimension of the residue field in order to conclude something about the complete discrete valued field. And then we are going to function field in one variable. So the conditions are like this. Suppose that Brouwer L dimension of the residue field, uh, Brouwer L dimension of kappa is at most n, and and Brouwer L dimension. This is a condition not only for kappa but also finitely generated uh, uh, function field in one variable over kappa. Okay, you want to bound this also. And Brouwer L dimension of kappa uh, kappa y is uh, n plus one, where y is a co over kappa. Is a co. You not only uh, bound Brouwer Brouwer dimensions of the residue field and its extensions, but also finitely generated extensions. So if you do this, then in fact, then Brouwer L dimension of the function field f is less than or equal to n plus 2. This is the result. Okay? I am not getting a feed. This Brouwer dimension that you are saying. Brouwer L. It is like a, it is like the, uh, the exponent, right? In some sense. This is Brouwer L, sorry, I am, you are right. Brouwer L dimension. So, I mean, you, uh, it is like a. The exponent. exponent. Brouwer dimension is the exponent. So, it that it period divide, index divides period power that exponent. That is what we are trying to bond. Okay? It is the exponent. So the conditions are for the residue field and its finite extensions as well as function field in one variable over the residue field. Okay, if the residue field is finite, okay, you know the Brouwer dimension because Brouwer group is trivial, and you take function field in one variable over a finite field, it's a global field situation, and you again know that index is exponent. Okay, you know hereditarily the Brouwer dimensions in good cases, like in the function field of periodic curves. If you put these conditions, then you have a function field in one variable over such a complete discrete valued field, it is the Brouwer dimension is bounded by n plus 2 for L different from P. So, this is the content of the result and um, of course, I will explain a little better next time what goes into the proof of uh, Harbeta, what is the technique and what is the statement of the patching, I will come to later. But the final result is this. This in fact uh, includes uh, Saltman's theorem because QPT is in that setting and L different from P. So you recover Saltman's theorem. Huh? L is different from the residue characteristic. The Brouwer L dimension of the residue field is n. That means index divides uh, uh, period power n, and for function field in one variable over the residue field, index divides a, a period power n plus one. Then over f you have index divides exponent power n plus 2. So this is the in particular uh, the square the Saltman's theorem is required. Okay. Once again <laughs> it is the same condition which is which comes into play that the characteristic of kappa is different from L. There is no clue uh, as such uh, I mean looking at their method what you do when the case when 
the characteristic of the residue field. You are looking at the prime p, which is the characteristic of the residue field. Okay, so recently I am just stating uh, the rest of the results which are jointly with Suresh. Maybe I can first straight away state the theorem and then come back to method of proof. So, so maybe I will not individually quote Suresh. This is joint with Suresh. This is just a few months old. So theorem. So let uh, again the same situation as I described there be a complete discrete value. Okay. Before stating the theorem, I just need one definition because I am going to work with bad characteristic. Okay. I am going to take the residue field characteristic kappa to be p say positive. Okay. So the Brouwer dimension and so on does not seem to be the right thing to look at and the residue field characteristic is p. So if you look through Carter's work and so on discussing this bad characteristic case, look at the whole theory of Carter, you need to look at some other integers, not really the Brouwer dimension. Okay. So what is the integer which is associated? This is the so called uh, p rank. So kappa is a characteristic uh, p field which is positive and then suppose uh, uh, the degree of kappa is to the p power. Suppose this is finite and this degree is p power n say. Suppose this is the case any perfect field kappa is kappa power p. So, n is 0 and suppose that this is finite then, then n is called the p rank of, of kappa and then suppose a1, a2 in this case suppose a n are elements of kappa such that kappa is generated by over the p power by a1, a2, a n where n is the p rank. This is called a p basis. Okay. So, finite p rank means kappa is to kappa power p has dimension p to the n which is finite and you can choose a p basis for such fields. So, in this case uh, when we look at this question what needs to be bounded seems to be the p rank of kappa rather than the Brouwer dimension of kappa which does not seem to play any role as I will show in the example soon. Okay. So, what is the theorem? So, let k be a complete discrete valued field. field with residue field kappa of characteristic 0 that is the only interesting case with residue field kappa of characteristic p positive. Okay. Let us take this case and further suppose p rank of kappa of kappa is n. Suppose the residue field has p rank n which is bounded, then, then the Brouwer uh, p dimension, essentially we are looking at Brouwer p dimension for p different from L, we have this result of Harbeta Hartman crash in which completely settles this issue. The Brouwer p dimension of uh, uh, f, okay, let me just say f is the function field of a curve, f is function field of a curve over k then the Brouwer p dimension of f is less than or equal to 2 n plus k. So, this is the bound we have for the Brouwer dimension, the, the bad Brouwer p dimension in terms of the p rank of the residue field. Okay, this is the main statement. A couple of remarks. First of all, in the, in the good characteristic case, we had an assumption on not only the Brouwer, Brouwer dimension of the residue field, but also for finite extensions and function fields in one variables over the, over the residue field. We had a condition. So, what happens to this condition here? But it is just uh, easy exercise that if you have a field kappa has a p rank n and you take function field in one variable over kappa, then the p rank is n plus 1. It is automatic. Okay. 
So in particular, if you take a finite field fq, the p rank is 0, it is a perfect field. And if you take function field in one variable or a finite field, it just is just 1. Okay, it just jacks up correctly, so we do not have to put a condition on function field. It is, it is a, the hereditary condition. Everything is automatic. Oh, or, or finite separable extensions, I mean, there are various things which automatically follow. So with this condition, you have the fact that uh, the Brouwer p dimension of f is 2n plus 2. Of course, I want to say this is not the best bound. However, it is the best bound as far as if the residue field is perfect. Okay. So, if kappa is perfect, this is the best bound and it is less than equal to 2 is the best you can get. So, as a corollary, you get what do you get for q p, uh, suppose k is a periodic field. The question I asked has an answer because the residue field is perfect here, it is a finite field. So, k is a periodic field and f is function field of a curve function field of a curve, then uh, Brouwer p dimension of f is Brouwer p dimension is 2. In particular, the Brouwer in uh, together with Saltman, the Brouwer dimension, Brouwer dimension of f is 2. So, you get a complete answer to this question for function fields of curves over periodic fields. Okay. The index always divides exponent squared irrespective of p it divides the characteristic of the residue field or not. Okay. This, is a, this is a corollary to this. Okay. So, next I want to explain what goes into the proof vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the others were able to get uh, how the others achieved the results for the good characteristic case and what goes into the bad characteristic case, what is the main ingredients. Okay. Yeah. Maybe, yeah, go ahead. So, for a p different from, uh, l different from p, okay. it is equal to 2. Yeah, but here. So, you, it can happen in some sense that uh, your residue field could be separably closed and so on. So, that kind of situation, I mean, it, it could be strictly, you know, it could be strictly less. You can take the separable closure of FP or algebraic closure of FP and that it, it could be smaller in, in general at the P. But a P different from L, it is exactly 2. It cannot drop. Yeah. Okay. So, so maybe I will orally explain because uh, I won't explain the bad characteristic more. So, what was the idea in the, in the proof of Saltman? For instance, when you take a QPT, a QPT and you take L, uh, suppose alpha in the Brouwer group of QPT and uh, uh, suppose L torsion of the Brouwer group, where L is not equal to P. Okay. So, what is the idea of the proof? So, what he does is there is something called the ramification for this algebra. So, this is a curve over a periodic field. First of all, you can you can look at alpha whether it comes from the Brouwer group of, for instance, uh, P1. So this is the function field of P1 of QP. Okay. So when you look at the question whether it comes from the Brouwer group of P1 of QP, then it may not come, and the obstruction to it's coming from P1 of QP lies in certain ramifications, and the ramifications can be measured by explicit residue maps if the characteristic is good. Okay. And the residue, residue maps are extremely explicit once you are given the algebra, you can compute and you know what to make 0 in order to split the ramification. So, this is a well known procedure if the residue field uh, has characteristic different from this L and you are taking L, L torsion in the Brouwer group. Any, any problem? Okay. So, but uh, it is not enough just to kill the ramification on P1 projective line over QP. It is better to take uh, the two dimensional scheme, the model over the integer zp. You take p1 of zp, then there, is, uh, there are co dimension 1 points coming from the special fiber for which the residue field has positive characteristic. So, you need to split more ramification if you want to get it, this Brouwer class from something in p1 of zp. Okay. You need to split more ramification if you want to get it unramified. 
Okay, suppose you can do it in a finite extension. After all, bounding index means you want to split the algebra in a extension of finite degree. Suppose you can split the ramification even on the model. Then what do you do? So then, I mean, this is you have this theorem of growth index. I mean, there are several proofs for this now. Why did you have to go to model? I, I'm just saying I'm going to state growth index theorem where where this model involves. Suppose uh, k is a periodic field. And x over k is a smooth projective. You can even assume geometrically integral curve over k. Okay, and uh, O is the integers. Suppose x to O is a regular proper model, proper model for the curve x over k. You take the curve. You have this is discrete valuation ring sitting inside K. You look at a regular such models exist because they are two dimensional phenomena. Then the theorem of growth index says that the Brouwer group of the model is zero. This is the key arithmetic fact. So something which has no ramification is zero automatic. And how to make it, uh, how to kill the ramification is a procedure which Saltman does very efficiently. And therefore, once you kill the ramification, you get something over a model, and the Brouwer group of the model is zero. Splitting ramification is equivalent to splitting the Brouwer class. So you get good bonds, provided you just follow what Saltman does to do this efficiently. He wants it in L squared extension. Okay, this is done exactly by splitting the ramification. But if the bad characteristic is this kind of residue maps do not exist, they are more complicated. The ramification pattern is more complicated. And this is exactly in the work of Cato. So how do you analyze the ramification in the bad characteristic case? So maybe I will explain. So is there a clock here? Or? OK, so oh, I have a lot of time. OK, so I so will explain uh, what you do in the bad characteristic case to get this result. So this is uh, Cato's work to start with. Let me explain. It is it's residue map is completely geometric and uh, I mean if you want some bond maybe it is easy to achieve but he gets exactly the right bond that is the whole point of Saltman's paper. Even a bond was not known before he wrote it down. Yeah. It's about lifting the cohomology from, uh, from the function from field the from this to the so whether, it, letter, whether it comes from the whole integral scheme x is decided by certain residue maps which take val values in h1 of the residue field. It is a Gizen map, exactly. But I do not want to write it down today because I am not going to discuss this case at all. So, yeah. Just one point, actually. So, uh, once you split ramification on the curve, uh, I guess that is maybe the point of the observation. The Brouwer group of the model is zero? Is that the Brouwer group of the model is zero. Ah, I see. So, splitting ramification is zero. Yeah, but there is slightly tricky, or oh, the tricky point is that first you will start with the model to start with. Okay? Then you have certain ramifications. Okay? You will try to split the residue by going to a function field, okay, ext finite extension. If you choose a model there, there may be new ramification curves yes. coming up. So this process may go on, and that is the whole point in the paper of Saltman. You don't go on, but you can stop. Okay, after going above, you may have new ramification curves coming up on a model corresponding to the extension. So you have to blow up and create an devices. Exactly, you might, which may just blow down to a point down, and you wouldn't have known anything about points below, close points. That is the point of Saltman's work. Okay, so what do you do in bad characteristic? So this is uh, this part is due to Cato. Okay, so k is a complete discrete valued field. And uh, uh, we'll assume the characteristic of k is zero. And uh, kappa is the residue field. And <coughs> it in the characteristic of kappa is p. And let me also assume that uh, the residue field, the p rank is n. And uh, let me assume that a1, a2, an is a p basis. 
Let us fix all these things. Let me also have some, I mean, uh, we will assume that we are looking at the, this is characteristic 0 and when we are trying to bound indices, whatever it is for any, any Brouwer class, we can p part of the Brouwer class, we can always go to coprime degree extensions. So, without loss of generality, we can assume that uh, k contains a primitive p root of unity. Contains, uh, we are in the characteristic 0 case, primitive p root of unity, no loss of generality. This we can assume. Okay. So, then let me denote for x, y in uh, <coughs> capital K. So, let me just uh, uh, denote by x comma y, it is an ad hoc notation, the cyclic algebra of degree P, cyclic algebra in the Brouwer group of, it is a cyclic algebra of degree P <coughs> defined by the relations i squared equal to x, j squared equal to y. This is defined with respect to a choice of a primitive zeta is a primitive p, choose a primitive p root of unity, primitive p root of unity. So, with respect to this choice, you can describe cyclic algebras like this, i squared is x, j squared is y, i j is zeta j i. Okay. So, if you put uh, p equal to 2, then you have the standard quaternion algebra associated to a pair of constants. Okay. This, is a, this is a generalization, this is a degree p algebra. So, if you grant block out of conjecture and so on, these algebras generate the p part of the Brouwer group of a field. Anyway, we are not going to use anything right now. Okay. So, what Cato does is, he has a filtration on the p part of the Brouwer group, whose uh, successive grades are completely understood in terms of the module of differentials of the residue field. Okay. That is naturally the characteristic p. The, the right tool is the module of differentials. So, that is what uh, is, is the content of Carter's work. So, p part of the Brouwer group of k, this is the 0th part of the, call this Brouwer, the 0th part of the filtration. So, what is the i th part of the filtration? So, let me just take the filtration of the units, okay. u. So, r is um, u i the standard uh, u filtration on the units for a complete discrete validated field just like in the arithmetic case. This is the set of all units u such that u is congruent to 1 mod pi power i. In a complete DVR you have this filtration on the units those which are congruent to 1 mod pi power i. So, in terms of this you define Brouwer k i the i part of the filtration is the subgroup generated by cyclic algebras x comma y, where x is in u i and y is in k star. Okay. So, the you put the constraint that one of the one part of the generators this x is in the i th part of the filtration okay. and you take the subgroup generated by all such cyclic algebras. This is the i th filtration on the Brouwer p part of the Brouwer group, this is the i th filtration. Okay. So, first of all this filtration is finite, because if an element is in too deep a filtration, okay, the too deep in the sense with respect to valuation of the prime p with respect to the given discrete valuation, it every element becomes a p -th power itself. Once x is a p -th power, this algebra is split, okay, it becomes 0. So, this is a finite filtration and what Carter does is to describe this Brouwer k i mod Brouwer k i plus 1 in terms of it he gives a map rho i from the left hand side objects are all either the residue field the multiplicative group, group of the residue field or the module of differentials. Okay. He gives maps which are subjective which is essentially enough for us also he gives uh, the kernel of these maps precise description of the associated gradient in terms of the module of differentials. So, let us uh, just denote by omega 1 of kappa, this module of differentials and so we know that if you have a p basis for kappa, then this is finite dimensional, this is a basis of omega 1 of kappa. Okay. So, for i greater than or equal to 1, 
the map goes from omega 1 kappa direct sum kappa yeah any so the model of differentials direct sum the underlying residue field into this the map is defined as follows you take x dy by y an element in omega 1 kappa and you take an element in the residue field z okay where do you send this this goes to let me have this notation that for x in kappa let x tilde lift in the ring of in r or r of o the integers let us by denote by twiddle the lifts so this element goes to 1 plus pi power i x comma y this cyclic algebra plus 1 plus uh, pi power i z comma pi okay. this is the sum of these two cyclic algebras defined with respect to this differential and this element z in kappa okay so this map in fact is well defined more this and it is in fact on to so this gives sort of generators for this part of the filtration in terms of some standard symbols i mean these are well understood mod p powers because uh, they have a finite p basis and finite basis for these vector spaces okay you see how you bound elements as sum of symbols in these successive quotients and of course you also have brower k0 the map is slightly different brower k1 here it goes from the milner k2 k2 of kappa mod p times milner k2 okay k2 mod p direct sum kappa star mod kappa star power p it is defined by you take a symbol x comma y the milner symbol and the class and you take a z in kappa star this tuple it simply goes to so lift x tilde y tilde because you are in brava 0 every element cells here lift it plus pi z tilde is it clear this is the map at the 0th level in fact this is an isomorphism and this is on to huh? pi huh? this is uh, here yeah. oh these are all tildes <laughs> absolutely there is a tilde here and yeah correct this is a this well defined and so on and so forth this is the map you may ask i said everything is in terms of the model of differentials what happens to this uh, this k2 mod p in fact this is actually a, it is contained in it is a subgroup of the uh, omega 2 the second exterior of the differentials and in fact uh, the much of carter's work is description of this injection and the image precisely of this modular this k2 small k2 inside the model of differentials Okay, so this is these maps essentially produce some kind of obvious generators for this successive filtration. From this, one gets the following. Even for complete discrete valued field, we have the following statement. Before going to function fields, we need to look at the complete DVRs. So let me make a the first statement. So k as as with the p rank of of kappa equal to n then k is a complete is the same setting then brower p dimension brower p dimension of k first of all is bounded by 2n i mean of course this is not the best bound unless okay this is at it is at least n by 2 this is the real fact that it is it keeps growing depending on the p rank of the residue field okay this is the important observation and uh, if n is at least 1 and if n is in the perfect field situation the Brouwer p dimension is just a uh, uh, Brouwer p dimension of k is uh, 1 in the case when it is perfect it is 1 and if uh, the, the higher uh, uh, higher ones these are the bonds it is quite curious because if you take uh, suppose you take f q you take a finite uh, finite field and you take function field in infinitely many variables over f q this is the way to produce infinite p basis and you can take the separable closure of this you take the separable closure of this function field you call this kappa okay okay this is a separably closed field this has no brower group whatsoever but it has infinite p rank 
So, p rank of kappa is infinite. Is infinite. In fact, you can produce uh, any any dimensional algebras of uh, division algebras over this. So, in particular, you get that Brouwer p dimension dimension of k is uh, also gross. So, you can find a complete discrete valued field with residue field separably closed of the the, the, bar, the characteristic p, and then the Brouwer p dimension just grows infinitely often. So, the real right candidate to bound is the p rank and not something for which the Brouwer group is 0 and so on. Okay, so, this is the story for even complete discrete valued field which is essentially based on what Carter has done his understanding his filtration value. Now, uh, we pass from now passing uh, so, what goes into the proof when you pass from uh, complete discrete valued field to function field of a curve function field of a curve. A curve over k. So, what is the phenomenon? Once again, here we use Harbater, Hartman, Crash, and Fatching, which is a useful tool, tool in this setting. Essentially, they, I mean, I will just say in a few words what goes into this kind of patching results. Yeah. Patching anyway. huh? What do you mean by patching? Okay, <laughs> patching means normally we think of patching when you have a scheme and some open covers or covers with respect to whatever topology and you are given local objects and there is gluing properly, then you have something over the over the full global situation. That is what we mean by patching generally in a scheme setting, but here the patching is in, in terms of a bunch of over fields. This is the beauty of it. Start from a field and you have a bunch of over fields and if you know some information for whatever algebraic gadget you have over the field, if you have some bounds over all these over fields which are in some sense simpler in terms of arithmetic, then you can conclude something about the base field. Okay. It is just field extensions, just they are huge field extensions. Okay. Maybe I will just say what they look like, what, what these patching fields are like. So, you, just, you have this curve over k, this complete discrete and you have the valuation ring and you choose a model. Okay. You can choose a model which is good such that the special fiber over the res residue field kappa, you can assume the special fiber has some uh, good normal crossing divisor and so on. There are finitely many nodal points and these are the components. You can assume whatever you want, whatever nice, nice, uh, nicely situated the special fiber is, you can assume. Now, the, I can say what the patching fields are. So, you just take a point of the special fiber. Either it could be a component, I am not talking of closed points, it could be a component or it could be a closed point. Okay, you take a point on the special fiber, now you look at the big, uh, the given scheme x, you take the local ring at this point. Either it is a discrete valuation ring or it is a two dimensional ring, depending on what is the height of this ideal. Now you take a completion of this, two, uh, this local ring, either it is a complete DVR or a two dimensional complete. 2 dimensional complete in the equal characteristic case we can think of as formal power series in 2 variables and the function field. Okay. So, this is a situation and you take the field of fractions of this completion, this is the over field fx, it is a giant, it is a huge field, but it is a complete discrete valued field with respect to a component of co dimension 1 point of x in the case when it is a discrete value, but you have to mine the points also 2 dimensional completions. When you look at this whole bunch of fields, they carry a lot of information about objects over f. It is like a covering. I mean, this so is this a is carrying the, the ramification data. Right, the the broad line. You can include if you start with the class, you can cover the ramification data, or if you take a quadratic form, you can include the ramification, or any tosser or homogeneous space, you can put in ramification and make it um, which captures everything you want. And for instance, in the Brouwer group case, this theorem is like. So, suppose uh, alpha in Brouwer group of k, Brouwer group of f. So, uh, L to, let us not look at the bad characteristic. I mean, I mean, this is for any any characteristic. I mean, you take alpha in the Brouwer group of f. If you can bound the index of alpha x, alpha fx, if this can be bounded, if there is a uniform bound for this, then there is a bound for alpha. 
these are the kind of theorems which follow okay and in some cases if they are complete divi yeah, no this f love uh, these are the big overfills if you can bound your data over this alpha going over to f x you can bound the same data for alpha this is the kind of results okay so and uh, as i explained when you go to complete dvr we have a discussion due to kato but you have to do a little bit more work take care of two dimensional computations no it needs some work if you for the two dimensional fields to to control this data once you control these things you have something over alpha using the patching results of har beta hartman crash this is exactly what we use to prove that it is bounded by 2n plus 2 okay for functional fields and in particular it gives for qpt and so on whatever bound you need it is not very different from okay so maybe i'll just give a brief introduction to what i will speak about next week in cmi okay so whenever you have some nice results of for the brower group or p part with p equal to 2 you have the two to two part of the two torsion in the brower group that is quite closely connected to quadratic forms in terms of clifford invariance so you should gain something about quadratic forms having done all this work about brower group okay the key key thing to track is the two part of the brower group over q2 okay okay now so we were able to prove that if f is as uh, f as in this result uh, as in this theorem uh, complete discrete value valued field and function field in one variable and suppose that kappa is perfect then we prove that that is in this additional assumption that the residue that is p rank is 0 then every 9 dimensional quadratic form 9 dimensional quadratic form over f has a non trivial 0 has a non trivial 0 okay that is uh, the so called u invariant this is essentially defined in terms of this is at most 8 okay if you okay so this we get as a bonus having proved something about the brower group it is not immediate but some more work is needed but this can be proved so now you look at this q2 of t that is dyadic field and you take function field in one variable over dyadic field so we proved in already um, 2007 or something that if you take qp of t where p is different from 2 v means myself and suresh that if p is different from 2 then the u invariant is at most 8 is what you proved but we couldn't handle the case p equal to 2 and of course by completely different um, arithmetic techniques like um, this is heath brown Heath Brown's work, which uh, counts uh, smooth points of intersection of quadrics over finite fields and so on. Okay, it is a totally arithmetic technique. Heath Brown and Leap uh, they proved that uh, this Heath Brown and uh, following Heath Brown uh, Leap's observation is that u invariant of q two t is also eight. Okay, they have for all primes and therefore for p equal to two also they have the same statement that every nine dimensional quadratic form has a non trivial 0 but the technique is completely different and it is arithmetical so you use the residue field this finite field and use geometry of intersection of quadrics over finite fields so we were quite upset i mean that uh, you could use galois cohomology techniques at most to get p not equal to 2 whereas um, straight they get for all primes but then we are a little happier now because this result includes the result of heath brown and leap that u invariant is 8 for Q2T as well, but the advantage is that there is no arithmetic in it. It is pure algebra. It is following similar kinds of techniques which we used before, which gets because we are not using any arithmetic that the residue field is finite. Any general field, complete discrete valued, all that we use is residue field is perfect. So absolutely rid of all arithmetic, we recover Heath Brown leap in a slightly more general setting. It's some kind of a trivial joy you get when do not use arithmetic and prove something purely in an algebraic setting and in a slightly more general setting not just for q2 but more general setting okay so this is this is all the story about uh, this uh, this question of brower, brower dimension and application there is one thing maybe i have a few minutes 
or should I stop for questions? Or, so the thing is, whenever you have a field with uh, every nine-dimensional quadratic form has a has a zero, such fields are nice. So over such fields, you can prove instead of H two, you take H three of F Z mod two. The third Galois cohomology instead of second Galois cohomology. So this H three. Okay, we know by Mercurius system that this is generated by such symbols a dot b dot c. Okay, these things generate H three, but if the u invariant is uh, every nine-dimensional form has a non-trivial zero, then you can show that this is equal to symbols a b c and f star. Every element in H three is actually a symbol. It is analogous to the Brough group index divides exponent square. Here, the index and exponent are the same. That is, every element in H three is a symbol. Okay. So this uh, this this is a consequence that u invariant is at most eight. For any such field, whenever we uh, we mention this to say he is very excited because uh, he is always interested in exceptional groups, and he is but in particular for G two the group G two the G two tosses are classified by octonian algebras, and octonian algebras are classified by the norm forms which is a threefold Fister form. They are very special eight dimensional forms. Such threefold Fister forms. Have the so-called Arison invariant, which looks like a dot b dot c, because if you take a Fister form, the corresponding invariant is always a cup product like this. But every element in H3 is a cup product, means every element here classifies some octonian algebra, and the H3 somehow has nice combinatorial descriptions. For instance, if you take f to be q p t and so on, q to t, there is a very nice combinatorial description of H3, just exactly the JSON sequence H3, H2. And so on. If you look at, you have very nice descriptions. So having the entire history consisting of symbols has some nice consequences for looking at G two tosses. So I stop. I stop at this.